It began as a holiday. Arthur Howitzer Jr., college freshman, eager to escape a bright future on the Great Plains, convinced his father, proprietor of the Liberty Kansas Evening Sun, to fund his transatlantic passage as an educational opportunity to learn the family business through the production of a series of travelogue columns to be published for local readers in the Sunday Picnic magazine. Over the next 10 years, he assembled a team of the best expatriate journalists of his time and transformed Picnic into the French Dispatch, a factual weekly report on the subjects of world politics, the arts, high and low, fashion, fancy cuisine, fine drink, and diverse stories of human interest set in faraway quartiers. He brought the world to Kansas. His writers line the spines of every good American library. Berenson, Sazerac, Cremence, Roebuck Wright. One reporter known as the best living writer in quality of sentences per minute. One who never completed a single article but haunted the halls cheerily for three decades one privately blind writer who wrote keenly through the eyes of others. The uncontested crackerjack of grammatical expertise. Cover illustrations by Hermes Jones. Famously gracious with his writers, Arthur Jr. was less courteous with the rest of the magazine staff. Oh no, what's that? I need a turkey. Stuffed and roasted on a table with all the trimmings and pilgrims. His fiscal management system was convoluted but functional. Give her 150 francs a week for the next 15 years against five American cents per word minus expenses. His most repeated literary advice, perhaps apocryphal, was simply this. Just try to make it sound like you wrote it that way on purpose. His return to liberty comes precisely 50 years after his departure on the occasion of his funeral, by which time the magazine's circulation exceeds half a million subscribers in 50 countries. A willow hamper containing umpteen pins, plaques, and official citations of the highest order is buried at his side, along with an Andretti ribbon mate and a ream of triple bond Egyptian cotton typing stock. He received an editor's burial. In his will, he stipulated that immediately upon his death, quote, The presses will be dismantled and liquefied. The editorial offices will be vacated and sold. The staff will be paid ample bonuses and released from their contracts. And the publication of the magazine will permanently cease. Thus, the publisher's obituary will also serve as that of this publication. All home delivery readers will, of course, be refunded pro rata for the unfulfilled portion of their subscriptions. His epitaph will be taken verbatim from the stenciled shingle fixed above the door of his inner office. Berenson's article, The Concrete Masterpiece. Three dangling participles, two split infinitives, and nine spelling errors in the first sentence alone. Some of those are intentional. <laughs> the Kremen story, revisions to a manifesto. We asked for 2,500 words, and she came in at 14,000, plus footnotes, endnotes, a glossary, and two epilogues. It's one of her best. <laughs> Sazerac? Impossible to fact check. He changes all the names and only writes about hobos, pimps, and junkies. These are his people. How about Roebuck Wright? His door's locked, but I could hear the keys clacking. Don't rush him. The question is, who gets killed? There's one piece too many, even if we print another double issue, which we can't afford under any circumstances. A message from the foreman. One hour to press. You're fired. Really? Don't cry in my office. Drink the masthead, cut some ads, and tell the foreman to buy more paper. I'm not killing anybody. Good writers. He coddled them, he coaxed them, he ferociously protected them. What do you think? For myself? I would start with Mr. Sazerac. These were his people. See what happens next. Order the entire movie, The French Dispatch.
Now available.